Section 1 On the Mountainside More than 14 centuries before Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the children of Israel gathered in the fair vale of Shechem, and from the mountains on either side the voices of the priests were heard proclaiming the blessings and the curses. A blessing if ye obey the commandments of the Lord your God, and a curse if ye will not obey. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 27 and 28. And thus the mountain from which the words of benediction were spoken came to be known as the Mount of Blessing. But it was not upon Jerusalem that the words were spoken which have come as a benediction to a sinning and sorrowing world. Israel fell short of the high ideal which had been set before her. Another than Joshua must guide his people to the true rest of faith. No longer is Jerusalem known as the Mount of the Beatitudes, but that unnamed mountain beside the lake of Gennesaret, where Jesus spoke the words of blessing to his disciples and the multitude. Let us in imagination go back to that scene, and as we sit with the disciples on the mountainside, enter into the thoughts and feelings that filled their hearts. Understanding what the words of Jesus meant to those who heard them, we may discern in them a new vividness and beauty, and may also gather for ourselves their deeper lessons. When the Savior began His ministry, the popular conception of the Messiah and His work was such as wholly unfitted the people to receive Him. The spirit of true devotion had been lost in tradition and ceremonialism, and the prophecies were interpreted at the dictate of proud, world-loving hearts. The Jews looked for the coming one not as a savior from sin, but as a great prince who should bring all nations under the supremacy of the line of the tribe of Judah. In vain had John the Baptist, with the heart-searching power of the ancient prophets, called them to repentance. In vain had he, beside the Jordan, pointed to Jesus as the Lamb of God, that taketh away the sin of the world. God was seeking to direct their minds to Isaiah's prophecy of the suffering Savior, but they would not hear. Had the teachers and leaders in Israel yielded to His transforming grace, Jesus would have made them His ambassadors among men. In Judea first, the coming of the kingdom had been proclaimed, and the call to repentance had been given. In the act of driving out the desecrators from the temple at Jerusalem, Jesus had announced Himself as the Messiah, the one who should cleanse the soul from the defilement of sin and make His people a holy temple unto the Lord. But the Jewish leaders would not humble themselves to receive the lowly teacher from Nazareth. At His second visit to Jerusalem, He was arraigned before the Sanhedrin, and fear the people alone prevented these dignitaries from trying to take His life. Then it was that, leaving Judea, he entered upon his ministry in Galilee. His work there had continued some months before the Sermon on the Mount was given. The message he had proclaimed throughout the land, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, had arrested the attention of all classes, and had still further fanned the flame of their ambitious hopes. The fame of the new teacher had spread beyond the limits of Palestine, and notwithstanding the attitude of the hierarchy, the feeling was widespread that this might be the hoped-for deliverer. Great multitudes thronged the steps of Jesus, and the popular enthusiasm ran high. The time had come for the disciples who had been most closely associated with Christ to unite more directly in His work that these vast throngs might not be left uncared for as sheep without a shepherd. Some of these disciples had joined themselves to Him at the beginning of His ministry, and nearly all the twelve had been associated together as members of the family of Jesus. Yet they also, misled by the teaching of rabbis, shared the popular expectation of an earthly kingdom. They could not comprehend the movements of Jesus. Already they had been perplexed and troubled that he made no effort to strengthen his cause by securing the support of the priests and rabbis, that he did nothing to establish his authority as an earthly king. A great work was yet to be accomplished for these disciples before they would be prepared for the sacred trust that would be theirs when Jesus should ascend to heaven. Yet they had responded to the love of Christ, and though slow of heart to believe, 
Jesus saw in them those whom he could train and discipline for his great work. And now that they had been long enough with him to establish, in a measure, their faith in the divine character of his mission, and the people also had received evidence of his power which they could not question, the way was prepared for an avowal of the principles of his kingdom that would help them to comprehend its true nature. Alone upon a mountain near the Sea of Galilee, Jesus had spent all night in prayer for these chosen ones. At the dawn he called them to him, and with words of prayer and instruction laid his hands upon their heads in benediction, setting them apart to the gospel work. Then he repaired with them to the seaside, where in the early morning a great multitude had already begun to assemble. Besides the usual crowd from the Galilean towns, there were great numbers from Judea and from Jerusalem itself, from Perea and from the half-heathen population of Decapolis, from Idumea, away to the south of Judea, and from Tyre and Sidon, the Phoenician cities on the shore of the Mediterranean. Hearing what great things he did, they came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And power came forth from him and healed them all. Mark chapter 3, verse 8, Revised Version. Luke chapter 6, verses 17 through 19, according to the Revised Version. Then as the narrow beach did not afford even standing room within the reach of his voice for all who desired to hear him, Jesus led the way back to the mountainside. Reaching a level space that afforded a pleasant gathering place for the vast assembly, he seated himself upon the grass, and his disciples and the multitude followed his example. With a feeling that something more than usual might be expected, the disciples had pressed about their master. From the events of the morning, they gathered assurance that some announcement was about to be made in regard to the kingdom which, as they fondly hoped, he was soon to establish. A feeling of expectancy pervaded the multitude also, and eager faces gave evidence of the deep interest. As they sat upon the green hillside awaiting the words of the divine teacher, their hearts were filled with thoughts of future glory. There were scribes and Pharisees who looked forward to the day when they should have dominion over the hated Romans and possess the riches and splendor of the world's great empire. The poor peasants and fishermen hoped to hear the assurance that their wretched hovels, the scanty food, the life of toil, and fear of want were to be exchanged for mansions of plenty and days of ease. In place of the one coarse garment which was their covering by day and their blanket at night, they hoped that Christ would give them the rich and costly robes of their conquerors. All hearts thrilled with the proud hope that Israel was soon to be honored before the nations as the chosen of the Lord, and Jerusalem exalted as the head of a universal kingdom.